Hello and welcome to this Sintratech Tech Talk about lasers. First, I would like to give a little bit of context. So, who are we? We are Sintratech and we build um, laser sintering um, equipment. So, this is in additive manufacturing, 3D printing. So, if you run an in-house uh, prototyping service or if you have small series production, um, you definitely should have a look at our products. Um, but first, I would like to introduce myself. Um, I'm Christian, I'm CTO and co-founder of Sintratech, and I'm excited to talk about lasers in the next about 30 minutes because I get asked about these quite a lot. And this usually goes like this. So our customers are used to seeing white polymer SLS parts because the industry has been printing white parts for quite a long time now. And Sintratech prints in black or dark parts. And this sometimes leads to confusion and I get asked a lot about this. And people ask, well, why is this? And I say, because of the lasers. And they ask, is it because the laser uh, needs more power? And I say, not really. Um, and, but I can explain, um, do you have 30 minutes? And usually people don't have 30 minutes, but today I was given 30 minutes, so I'm very happy to talk about why we are printing in black parts and not white parts. Let's jump in with some laser physics. So I keep it simple, but um, we need some basics. So <clears throat> the process of laser sintering um, I'm going not too deeply into this because that would be another tech talk. But basically we shoot a laser at some polymer powders and we melt one layer and we do this over and over again. So we get in the end, we stack all these layers to a 3D printed polymer part. Um, this is la selective laser sintering. And as I said, I'm not going too deeply into this. What I want to talk about today is the laser and the laser beam itself. So we steer a small laser point across a powder cross section and wherever the laser hits, the powder melts and we can form a 3D object. Um, this is important because with this, we can print pretty much every um, object without having a tool for it. So we don't need a mold or anything like that. We can just use the laser and steer it across the, the powder bed. Now we do this with two motors and two mirrors. You can see them um, up here. Um, we have an, one motor for the x-axis and one for the y-axis. And with this, we can steer the laser across the powder bed. We do this very quickly and we have a focus lens to focus the beam onto the powder to have a very small laser spot and to melt the powder. Now, talking about the laser beam itself, um, I would like to, to talk about the light. So what's different about laser light than compared to normal light? Um, if you have on the very left here, normal light coming from, from instance, from a lamp, um, this is so-called incoherent light. So you have all the colors mixed and they're going in all kinds of dif different directions. And your eye actually um, looks at all the colors and decides, okay, this looks white to me. So white light is mixed light with all the colors. In a laser, you have one very distinct color going in synchronous in one direction. That's kind of the difference. And it's much better to work with this uh, for this application because it's better to um, have optical components manufactured just to one um, coherent light. When I say color, um, what do I mean by color of light? It's actually a um, electromagnetic wave and the color is determined by the wavelength. So I plotted here three waves, a blue one, a green one, and a red one. And as you can see, the blue one is the shortest one and the red one is the longest one. Down here, you can see the whole entire um, visible light spectrum. So our eyes can see 
from blue to red and that's about it. And the, these are shorter waves and these are longer waves. Now, why is this important in laser sintering? Why do we, do we care about the color at all? So basically it's because of the interaction with objects. I have this example um, for you. So if we have incoming white light that is shining onto a green apple, what actually happens there, the green apple, the material of the apple acts like a mirror for green wave length. So the green light is reflected from the apple and your eye up here is perceiving the apple as green because the green light is reflected. The blue and red portion of the light is absorbed by the apple. So it gets stuck in the apple and the apple gets a little bit warm because of it. So the, the apple absorbs these wavelengths as heat. And that's how your eyes are actually able to see the apple as green. Now, if we want to cut the apple with a laser, we can use a very powerful green laser beam and try to cut the apple. But actually what happens is almost all of the energy of this light is reflected by the apple and nothing happens. So if we want to use a laser to cut this apple, we need, for instance, red light because all of the red portion of the light is absorbed in heat and voila, we are able to cut the apple. So that's the trick about it. And even though the red laser has exactly the same energy as the green before. One special case is black. So <clears throat> if we have a dark or black um, material, all the visible light wavelengths are um, absorbed and our eyes don't receive any light from the object, so we see it as black. And so basically what this means, if we use black powder or black objects, we can use pretty much every laser pointer in the visible uh, wavelengths that are exists and we can cut this object. Now the opposite are bright or white objects. These act kind of like a mirror for the whole uh, visible light. So if uh, visible light or white light is incoming onto a white object, everything is reflected, nothing is absorbed, and we see the object as being white. Um, a, a very simple uh, example of this is actually a car. So you might uh, recognize this if you put a white car close to a black car into the sunlight after a while you notice the black car will get much hotter than the white car and this is exactly because because of this effect now how can we cut white objects then for this i have to uh, expand your view a little bit into the um, electromagnetic spectrum so basically if you go from short blue waves, even shorter, you end up in X-rays and gamma rays. So that's the same, but you cannot see it um, by eye. And if you go from red waves, even longer, you go first into infrared, microwaves, radio waves. It's also the same, but also these waves you cannot see by eye. Now, I want to um, extend are three waves with two new ones. One is the near infrared. So this is just a little bit longer than the red wave. And we have the far infrared, which is much longer, like 10 times longer. And I have chosen these two because of the absorption of polymers. Now, I have plotted here the absorption spectrum of polymers. And as you can see, um, if here in this direction there is uh, an elevation we see that polymers are absorbing the light in this region so we have absorption in the uv spectrum but we don't have good lasers there so uh, we don't really care about this region then in visible light there is no absorption 
in short infrared, there is no absorption, but I included it because we have very, very good lasers there. So some of the best lasers you can buy for money are produced here. And then we have the long infrared um, spectrum and here polymers absorb naturally. So you don't have to have a color, a uh, different one, they absorb it. And this is why these, uh, these two um, are included now. And including these, um, the example would look the following. So we have all the waves coming in, the short ones, including the short uh, infrared spectrum are reflected. And the only one being absorbed from white parts is the long infrared one, the really long ones. And this tells us, okay, so if we want to work with a white polymer powder, we basically need a laser that works in this long infrared um, spectrum. And having such long waves has other inputs as well. So um, not to go too deeply into this, but basically the shorter a wave, the easier it is to have a really small focus spot. You can see the mathematical formula here. And if you have a very short wave, it's much easier to have a small focus point. If you have a really long wave, you get a, a larger focus point. Now, why would you have, uh, want to have a small focus point? It's like drawing with a pen or with a brush. With a pen, it's much better to have a smaller resolution, sharper details, um, and also sharper edges. So your part quality will generally improve if you have a smaller um, laser spot. One thing that I want to include, and it's, this would be a whole another topic, but depending on what material you're using to build your lasers and how the laser is built, there are different shapes of laser spots. Um, we start with the single mode, so you have more or less one point of light um, that has one intensity maximum. And from there, there are several multi-modes. So moving up the ladder, um, depending on the material you use, you don't have one point, but several. And this can or cannot be a problem for your application. Now that we have the basics, I want to have a look at three products in the industry. So one of it is, um, stands here for the general industry standard, I would say. Uh, the picture is of an EOS machine. And before we, Sintratech, started, basically every machine was using um, these CO2 gas lasers um, in the very far infrared spectrum that I was talking about. So you would be able to print uh, bright or white parts. When we started, we first built the Sintratech kit. It's a desktop machine and it uses very short blue laser light. Um, I will talk about why, but this, the middle product that uh, is displayed here is our Sintratech S2, and it uses a near-infrared laser. So in this, it is already uh, invisible, but still quite short uh, wavelengths. Now there are several advantages and, dis and disadvantages um, on top of the, the color. So one is footprint. If you have a diode laser, these are very small. So I have, I have described it here as a credit card footprint. So you can more or less build a desktop class um, product like we did very easily. Um, the fiber lasers are the size of about a shoe box. And then we have the CO2 lasers and these are long glass tubes. Uh, they start at the size of about a skateboard but they can be much longer and they are um, bulky and you would never be able to print, uh, to build such a small product as the Sintratech kit with such a large CO2 laser. Then I want to talk about the absorption. Um, I think I made this pretty clear in the first part. So those two um, diode lasers and fiber lasers, they need absorbers so that 
part need to be black and the CO2 lasers with the far infrared, they are operating in a region where the polymers absorb it naturally so we can work with uh, bright powders as well. Then moving on to the focus spot, um, basically the diode lasers are multi-mode so they have a, not one but several spots so this um, your part will suffer a bit from this but also they are quite have a short wave so um, you can focus it down very good so this makes up for the the multi-mode um, in some way but the best laser by far is the fiber laser with a single mode short wave so you can focus it down really nicely have a perfect spot co2 lasers are single mode as well but because of the 10 times uh, longer waves it's much harder to focus them in a teeny tiny spot I think one of the most important topics about the laser is lifetime. So I plotted here the lifetime of these products and uh, I researched corresponding animal. So how long does a ferret live? Now I know it's uh, about 10 years. And this is the same about the, the diode lasers and fiber lasers. They have lifetimes up to 10 years or even more, while the CO2 lasers they only have about one year of lifetime. Uh, so if you have a product that you need to replace your most expensive uh, component, the laser, every other year, it's uh, quite expensive. But if it lives 10 years, that's no issue. So lifetime is a big, uh, big topic. So in conclusion, um, we have these three areas um, of focus. And I would say it's fair to assume that no laser can excel in all three of them. So not one of them is just the best in every, one, in every category. So what we focused at is beam quality and cost of ownership. So the increased lifetime, the small footprint and the exceptional beam quality just make the fiber laser stand out to us. And I want to talk about the material color. So what are we losing actually here? And people or customers sometimes ask, do we suffer from material diversity? And because not every, um, not every powder or every polymer is available in black as well. Now, this is quite easy. So what you can do uh, or what the industry does is add additives and usually it's done with carbon black. That's a very inexpensive and good um, absorber. So a lot of materials can be um, dry blended with just a little bit um, of absorber additive. I've described it at 0.5% and the material will not suffer from, from this small amount of absorbers. And then uh, it's printable with our printer. Now, with post-processing uh, is another region that needs focus on. So there are several different uh, post-processing methods and I have plotted some of them here. And we have all of these, I would call, call them coating um, post-processing methods. So whenever a small coat of something is applied to the product, then it doesn't matter if the parts are white or black. So the only difference is if you scratch the coating um, after, the part beneath would be black or white, but that's the only difference. So for all the coatings, there is absolutely no difference in post-processing whether you have black or white parts. Then one big area is dyeing. So if you want to dye the part itself, then there is a difference. Uh, if you have dark parts, only dark colors are uh, available. And if you have white parts, you can do pretty much every color. The last thing is if you want to have them untreated. So if you have, want to have the natural part uh, untreated, uh, uncolored, then of course the one is black, the one is white, but there is one important thing for uh, instance, our customers from automotive uh, really enjoy this. Um, 
So here, with the UV stability, black parts are naturally much more UV uh, stable. So if you put them into the sun, they will stay black for a very long time. And the white parts will start to um, degrade, get a little bit uh, yellow. Uh, this is because of the sun and oxygen. So this is uh, an advantage of black parts. So as you can see, it really depends on your application, on what lasers and what parts um, are desired. And for us, it's really no questions. We are going for the very nice fiber lasers and the black parts. And I hope this presentation was able to show you why our parts are black. And I'm very happy to answer any of your questions. So the question was, if I want to buy a Sintratec product and I really want to print in white powder, um, is it possible to include it in, your, in our system, so to build it? Um, and I would say definitely, but it depends on batch size. So if you order uh, enough of these machines, we will build everything for you. Uh, for one machine today, no. Welcome. You said that there's additives in the material. Um, does this mean only the black material has additives, or do the other materials also have additives in them? The white one. So these. 3D printing polymers are always a mix of, of base polymers and lots of additives. So um, the white powders have additives in them as well, but different ones. They also um, are improving performance with the uh, CO2 lasers I mentioned, but um, they are white to the eye. So um, you don't notice them as much as the black additives that we put in. If, so the question was um, if, if we could color it a different color, the powder, so not black, but maybe green or, or uh, something like this. And this would be um, possible if this specific ab absorber has um, absorption in this uh, fiber laser range, absolutely, yes. So if you use, the, or the question was about strengths of the parts, do they differ from white to black parts and the lasers? And in, in general, I would say no. So if you use the same polymer, um, they, there are slight differences, but basically um, the small amount of black additive that we put in um, is, is, makes no difference. So they are um, the same in strength, but um, if, you, if you look at different machines and different parameter sets, there still is, is a difference, um, but I would say a, a small one. Yes, and the question was about uh, the part itself and not the, the strength or, um, 
or the color, but more or less the, the shape of the part, if there's a difference. And definitely there is. So um, as I mentioned in this presentation, the fiber laser can be focused down to a smaller, nicer spot. And because of this um, smaller details, better uh, resolution and also sharper edges are possible with the fiber laser. Why have you decided to build a small system, system instead of just one very big? So we have decided to build a small system, which was the question, and not uh, one very big one, um, because we see a lot of advantages in having redundancy and scalability. So basically, if you have a lot of medium-sized um, or small systems, you are able to scale your in-house prototyping or small series or large series production. You can start small by having one system, then move on having two, three, four, and um, not bind a lot of capital at first. But also you have redundancy in printing. So if you want to start one print in the morning, you can do that. And if there is another one coming uh, on uh, noon, you can print then. And if you have one large machine, you always have to wait until you have enough prints to, to fill the whole system. Or if some parts might um, fail during print, it's much better to have, uh, or if your system fails, I mean, it's, it's uh, broken and you have 10 systems, then you have still 90% of your production capability. If you have one large system and it breaks, you have 0%. So that's um, much better for redundancy. Okay. Yes. Can I develop my own material on this uh, machine? Absolutely. So we have an upcoming product with the open parameters. So you will be able to access every parameter of the machine and develop your own materials. Um, for this, you have, for instance, to um, have a variance in laser power or laser speed, and you can uh, choose your own parameters for your material. Absolutely. Good, good. Thank you.